Welcome to the Youth Ignite, South African and American Youth Dialogue on the Green Economy podcast, where you take through some of the most exciting green career journeys by true South Africans. We follow their highs and lows and follow their failures and triumphs, as well as tips and advice on how they got to where they are today, helping you prepare for your most meaningful career in the green economy. You will also get to explore American case studies and what we can learn from these to apply to our uniquely beautiful South Africa. Join us. Today we'll be speaking to Kushinga Kambarami. He is a green building specialist and consultant and working in property development sector in South Africa. Welcome and thank you again. Uh, We're really looking forward to learning from you and our, our listeners I'm sure we'll love hearing your insights. So, thank you very much. Um, thank you, thank you. And uh, Kushinga, would you like to tell us a bit about yourself, your background, where you come from, and a little bit of your journey to where you are today? Sure. So, my name is Kushinga. I was born in Harare, in Zimbabwe. I attended school there. Uh, went to study town planning urban planning at the University of Zimbabwe. Graduated there in 2005, then moved to Namibia first, then moved to South Africa, and I've been here since 2007. And since then, I have worked in the consultancy space with architects, engineers, interior architects, and mostly property developers and uh, construction companies and the like. So I grew to become more of a project manager in in the sector and less of a town planner. And I then obtained my master's in sustainable urban planning and development from the university University of Johannesburg. I also obtained my PMP, the project management professional, uh, certification from project man- from the Project Management Institute, which is a global project management uh, accreditation. So those are um, uh, just a, a high level view of my qualifications and my journey. Wonderful. That's that sounds really exciting, and I love how you did take a little bit of a detour along the way. You started in time planning. Then as you worked, you probably realized that, wait, this is more interesting. I want to pursue this. Um, Tell us about where you started to realize that you didn't want to be only a town planner. You wanted to try other things. Well, you know, um, I think from the beginning, our lecturers in university, when I did my first degree, always told us that the your first degree is really to open your eyes and to get you in the industry. But once you start working is often when you discover your, your, your passions or your niche where you want to make a name for yourself. So I've never um, restricted myself to that, to that mold of a town planner. You know, I, I have worked for engineering firms as an engineering project manager when I had no engineering qualification whatsoever. But, you know, I held my own, did very well at it. Um, And some colleagues of mine might have taken that to be quite risky because they took the safer path. But I've always believed that um, I should follow the work that interests me. So if I discovered a new niche in, in the construction sector and it piqued my interest, I would immediately start seeking out how I can uh, work more in that area and learn more about it because that way then it doesn't um, it doesn't feel like work you you do it with a passion it's something you're genuinely interested in you're not just doing it for for a paycheck so that is that is more or less how I uh, ended up deviating and finding my way towards where I am now that's wonderful I love that you said that. It's so important. That's a message we give to people all the time in our coaching, in our training is that, you know, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. It'll always just be Absolutely. this fun journey of exploration. Yeah. 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 No, I can definitely. definitely hear that through what you're saying. And it sounds to me as well that you are entrepreneurial, even though you've worked for companies 
you've always set your own path and, and made your own work kind of fit things that you're passionate about. Yes, and that is a, a very interesting point that you make because I often say this to people that um, having an entrepreneurial spirit doesn't mean you must go off and start your own company. <laughs> you know, you can be you can be entrepreneurial within an organization that allows you that flexibility to innovate, to to you know uh, map new pathways and basically be free to explore and to chase, pursue opportunities where where you where you see them. And there's definitely a, a need for that. And there are roles that require that in the industry, whether it's in business development, it's in managing client relations, you know, it, it's, it's such an untapped and, and misunderstood kind of a character trait that if you're entrepreneurial, it does not necessarily mean that you must immediately drop everything and go start your own company. Perhaps one day you can, but it's best to, to work in an environment that allows you to nurture to nurture that, and develop your skills, get really good, and if it is on the cards for you, then one day you can branch off on your own and, and start your own thing. Yeah, yeah, that's that's lovely. I, I really like that. It's um, that you will give yourself time to nurture that, and find the right organization that is willing to nurture your innate abilities, and then, as you say, one day. That innovation that is so natural to you can eventually turn into entrepreneurship. And especially in this, this field, it's very complex. So it pays to actually work for someone for the first couple of years, learn and figure out the whole system before you start risking everything. Absolutely. And in South Africa, it's a very, it's a very small community, you know, that's working on green buildings and sustainable uh, urban development. And you might find that if you are a startup company in this sector that is trying to get work, you will struggle because um, you, you, don't have a, you don't have that track record. But if you've been working with these major firms that, that get all this work for, I don't know, 10, 12 years and everyone knows you, the day you then say I'm setting up shop and I am uh, I'm starting my own thing, then everyone knows exactly who you are because they've they've been with you in that journey and it's such a small community. Everyone knows everyone, you know. Yeah. That's, uh, that's capable, yeah. Yeah, and they they're willing to bet on you because they know your work ethic. They like working with you. Makes it a lot easier of a transition. Absolutely. Yeah. So tell us about your job. What does it actually entail? So my job is, is twofold. So sticking to that entrepreneurial uh, spirit that you're mentioning. So I, funny enough, actually have two full-time jobs. The one full-time job is I am a property developer for property development manager for a residential property developer that builds a lot of green housing estates. Um, the projects that I'm involved with at the moment are mostly in uh, Gauteng and Malanga. So it's um, sort of in the east end of Johannesburg and also in Nelspreet in Pumalanga. Um, but the company also has a few projects going in the Western Cape, but my involvement there is limited. Then the second job that I have, which uh, my full-time employer, as I said, allowed me to do, because you have to find the right company that allows you to be entrepreneurial, is I consult for the International Finance Co uh, Corporation, the IFC, which is a part of the World Bank Group. So certain days a week, I'm doing work for them. And other days of the week, I'm doing uh, my, my main work with, um, with the property developer. So with the IFC, I'm a green building consultant working with the green certification called the EDGE, Excellence in Design for Greater Efficiencies which is one of the preeminent uh, green certifications for housing type projects in South Africa. So, yeah. Gosh, you've got a full plate. That sounds exciting, but I'm sure it's fun. It's, it's fun, but it can be taxing at, at times, but, you know, it's, it's part of the journey. You look back on it and say, how did I manage all of that? Yes. <laughs> but yeah. again, you know, if you are... If you love what you're doing, you'll be able to withstand 
most challenges because your passion will drive you. Definitely, definitely. So it's it's one of those. I've always said, if you find yourself looking at your watch while you work, then you're probably not in the right job. You know, you stop when the work is done. Uh, and sometimes that's seven at night. Sometimes that's ten at night. Sometimes it means if I can't sleep at two in the morning, I'm just going to go and work. But it doesn't feel like work because it's it's just a list of things I need to achieve. Uh, you know, by the end of the week or by the end of that day. Um, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. So how does EDGE compare with the LEED certification system? So um, EDGE maybe is give lot. us a bit of background on both, if, if you can. Okay, so my knowledge of LEED is, is somewhat limited because in South Africa, LEED has mostly been used to certify corporate offices and commercial buildings and the like. It never found much traction in the residential space. And part of that is because it has, I think it's about nine processes or nine, nine, um, nine criteria where EDGE only has three. So EDGE only requires that uh, a project perform 20% better in terms of water savings, energy savings, and uh, embodied energy in materials than the local baseline. So EDGE actually is based on an online app which is a global, it's a global certification, but on that online app, it has a global baseline loaded for every country and every major city across the world. So meaning if you're doing a project in South Africa, it uh, offers you certain measures that you can implement on your project. Uh, and uh, you select those that the project can afford and can achieve until you achieve 20% uh, greater efficiency above the local baseline. So that means in South Africa, if it's for energy saving, it means you need to save 20% more energy than your son's uh, 10400 XA pushes onto you. So if it's a project in Nigeria, then it's completely different because they don't have uh, part XA, they, they have their own building codes. So that is why I think EDGE has found a lot of success in South Africa. There's about... 92 housing projects certified to date since 2015 when it was introduced and about 38, uh, 38,000 homes certified. Yeah. Wow, that's so, a lot. Uh, Goodness. 38,000 homes. That includes uh, counting individual apartments as a home and freestanding homes as well. And, and it's, it's increasing. So um, some of the players that have made a great impact on that are Companies that you'll know, like Bowling Properties, they're a massive edge champion. And International Housing Solutions, IHS, they do a lot of social housing, affordable housing. All of their developments are, are green certified. Mm -hmm. And essentially, the benefit with edge is that it's got great social impact in that it quantifies the, the savings in, in energy, water and materials. And it actually translates to lower utility costs for the end user of that home, whether it's a rental client within the rental portfolio or it's someone that's purchasing the home outright with a mortgage, then they will, will be paying in general at least 20% um, less for their water and electricity than a standard home. And that, that I think, is the business case for it that, it that has made it so successful in South Africa. That's amazing. So you actually have benefits on all sides, benefits for the planet, benefits for the consumer, benefits for the company, because now you actually have a business case and there's sustainability in that type of project. Absolutely. Both financially and, and environmentally, I mean, yeah. Financially and environmentally, and it has gained so much traction that it's, it's a globally recognized certification like LEED or like Green Star. So you find that... Uh, large-scale developers are attracting a lot of um, investment in the, in the form of green bonds or green equity uh, or preferential uh, lending rates from, from the capital markets simply because they signed that pledge to say all our developments are, um, are age certified. So, uh, and then in South Africa now, all the major lenders for, for mortgages now offer preferential um, 
mortgages. So you, you get a lower interest rate from FNB, APSA, Standard Bank. Uh, who else did I leave out? <laughs> all, all four major banks will give you a preferential lending rate if you're purchasing a, an age certified home. So there's, there's, no, uh, there's no downside to it, really. It, no, it costs, the only downside, obviously, is it costs a little more upfront in terms of capital expenditure for the developer. But they do see that return in terms of quicker sales, um, uh, uh, higher tenancy if it's a rental portfolio. And obviously, the preferential lending rate does a lot to offset that, that, that additional cost as well. Sure, that's incredible. Okay, wow. There's, um, you know, these are interesting things that one wouldn't expect is so, so entrenched in the system already that the banks are on board and all of these role players are already playing a magnificent and kind of a, a potent role in all of this. It's really wonderful. Absolutely. And it just shows all the different skill sets that can go into this one arena of the green economy, which is green building. It is. And there is so many career opportunities because just from a financial standpoint, we, we have in the IFC team a lot of economists that work in the green building team, you know, that are part of doing these market assessments and studies to find out which, which country in Africa is ready for us to introduce edge into, you know. Uh, and then you have obviously people with a finance qualification or an accounting qualification that structure these deals with the developers, uh, structure deals with financial institutions. So, and this is apart from, you know, the, the built environment professionals, your architects and engineers. And across the board, there's a lot of work being done in training all these different professions, people that are already in the industry, graduates that are still uh, completing their first degree, to actually uh, explain to them what a green building is, all the certifications that are out there, and then obviously why EDGE is kind of the low-hanging fruit and is the easier one as a, as a first step into, into working in green buildings. Um, it's, it's a lot more user-friendly. It's got built-in calculators, so you don't need to to be super technical, to calculate all these ratios. You just need to know what the parameters are, enter them, and it, it, it kind of works it out for you. But there's a massive opportunity. I know IFC also trained more than 400 municipal officials on edge and green building awareness, just making them aware what a green building is. So when they see those plans with these innovative systems built in, they know exactly what they're looking at and they can make sense of it. So it's, 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 a, it's an exciting industry. It's both about certifying the buildings, but it's about creating a market for it, uh, telling the end consumer why they want to live in a, in, a, in a green certified home. And once the market starts to understand that, like we're seeing in South Africa, the market starts to ask for it. They say, well, is your, is your home a green, a green certified home? Because they know that it's going to cost me less to own this home than a, a standard home. And in a way, it's future-proofed as well because bylaws and building codes are all trending towards there. I mean, to, in, in, on the 16th of November last year, we saw the issuing of edition two of SANS 10400 XA, which is a stricter version for energy efficiency, energy efficiency on, on new buildings in South Africa. And the SANS is currently working on getting part XB approved, which now will require... Uh, water efficiency on all new buildings, which was never a requirement before. So it's it's really exciting. And I suppose the average person does see the transformation, but doesn't really know where it's coming from and what it means. Like, for instance, since 2011, you would have seen all new homes that are built, even affordable homes, even RDP homes, have a solar geyser. That is a requirement of SANS 10400 Part XA which was introduced in 2011, which requires that at least 50% of your hot water is generated through solar on any new building. And the next step is to retrofit that to all existing buildings. Uh, you have cities, all four major cities, metros in South Africa have signed up to the C40s, 
Cities Initiative, which is a pledge to say all new buildings that are built must have a, um, a, a zero carbon footprint by the year 2030. And by the year 2050, all existing buildings must have a zero carbon footprint. So it's coming because buildings actually contribute about uh, 20% of greenhouse gas emissions globally. So people don't realize that because when we speak of greenhouse gases, we think about vehicles and uh, switching to electric vehicles, etc. But buildings are actually uh, an untapped opportunity in terms of saving the planet and reducing greenhouse gases through very achievable, simple measures that just require the developer or the builder to not just build something the way they've always done it, but to say, can you stop? What minimal interventions can you put to just make this home efficient? Can you size your windows differently so that that home uh, is more thermally efficient? It retains the indoor temperature for longer. So if it's hot outside, it doesn't get too hot so that someone ends up switching on the fan or the aircon to cool themselves down because that's increased electricity consumption. Can you choose your materials differently you know, and, and, and the like. I can talk about this all day, but I'll stop there. <laughs> no, thank you. That is really fascinating. Um, I'm, I'm really enjoying hearing you speak about it and you definitely seem to have a passion for it. And um, I, the thing that is also surprising is the extent of the contribution to the greenhouse gases. And as you say, you wouldn't really expect that. Uh, yeah. We only just think of cars and mines and fires and whatever mm. so you mentioned something interesting that it's future proofed and that really brings me to my next question is is the career in the space anyone entering now into the green building industry is their career likely to be future proofed as well are there many opportunities for people entering now or in future Definitely, definitely. Um, it's a novelty now, and it's a catchphrase now, I'd say green building, but it's going to be the new normal. So if you can enter the industry with that uh, qualification or knowledge or awareness of what green building practice is, then most certainly you have, you have a leg up uh, above someone who, who isn't aware. And in terms of future-proofing your career, most certainly... Um, we, we actually don't have enough professionals that are proficient, that know how this entire green building certification and what building green looks like, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a huge, huge demand and it's, it's only going to grow. That's wonderful. That's really great. And I, I, I use the term retrofitted because you've, you've used it now before. And I think, it sounds as though you also managed to retrofit your qualification and add pieces. You kind of built up a qualification that wasn't your traditional trajectory into this career. And would you say that there's still possibility for people to just come in with a, a slightly unrelated field and build on them with short courses or certificates and not have to start again at university? Oh, yes, definitely. So the good thing about working in this space is if, for instance, you, you already have or are close to completing your architecture qualification or your engineering qualification, you can get a professional certification. So you can reach out to the Green Building Council of South Africa, get trained as, a, as an accredited professional for LEED, for Green Star. That's all you need because it, it's designed with that in mind, knowing that most of the professionals in the industry did not have this on their curriculum, you know, and it's still not on the curriculum in many courses. So instead we have um, these courses for, to get you certified as an accredited professional. I myself am accredited for EDGE, but there's a, an AP qualification for Green Star for LEED as well. And pairing that with your qualification and your past experience definitely gets you where you need to, to be in order to start off. But uh, obviously the big, the big plus is once you've built up a bit of experience because there's nothing quite like working on a few 
on a few green building projects to to actually then hone your skills and and make a name for yourself and and yeah chart your, your career your career path forward wonderful yeah and i suppose also test your limits test your interests and, and get to know yourself a bit while you absolutely working and growing yeah so it's 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 one of those areas of of specialization where you really you really find someone that works in this space that isn't passionate about it because it is tedious work so i i do have to say that as a warning <laughs> it is extremely technical it is very detail uh, oriented so if you are not wired that way or if you're not passionate about it it yeah you can look at it and think why should i bother <laughs> you know so it's not easy it's it's quite difficult all these accredited professional qualifications i mentioned do have an exam at the end of the course which you can fail if you if you if you're not uh wired for it or if you if you don't apply yourself but yeah it's 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 very interesting and and engaging and exciting constantly changing and growing yeah that's, that's really lovely and and thank you for that bit of advice i think it's important for people coming in to know you need to be one who pays attention to detail who likes getting into the technical bits and you still can see a bigger picture if i i suppose i know i wouldn't be someone who could cope in that kind of environment but i know many people who would thrive in that yeah yeah. So what advice do you have for someone who's wanting to enter the green building space and make it a success? Yeah, so I I would say you 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 firstly have to choose what track you want to take. So I'm going to take the track of a um of a technical person uh, such as an architect, urban urban designer, engineer, or, or quantity surveyor, or if that's your pre-existing qualification, it's to then decide whether you want to stay on that track because you don't have to. You know, I know colleagues who are engineers but went on to do a postgrad in development finance because they wanted to move to the finance part of things, and they did so successfully. So I suppose it's a bit of self-awareness. Do you want to work in the number side? of the business you want to work in the marketing side of the business there's space for marketing professionals as well because as you can imagine there's a lot of business development that must be done marketing creating awareness creating new markets you know uh or do you want to work uh, which track do you want to take basically and then there is obviously steps that you can take towards that so for instance if you are already on the finance part or I thinking to switch to the finance part you might look at qualifications like um the ESG audit qualifications you know for environmental social and governance governance reporting there is a huge demand for audit professionals that have an ESG qualification simply because there is a lot of impact funding on the market from uh, large multinational and and various other capital market um stakeholders that need to see that the funds they have invested towards environmental social and governance targets have had the impact that they require and typically people working in ESG are accountants or people with an audit qualification so that's something you can add on to your resume if you if you are a finance professional uh definitely look at ESG uh if you are within the technical side of things an architect engineer planner or quantity surveyor then you can look at as i said the the accredited professional certifications that you can find freely on the green building council of south africa website you can become an edge expert or an edge auditor you can become uh, a green star ap you can become a lead ap um yeah and adding that on top of your qualification definitely goes a long way uh in in terms of making your your cv stand out and in doing this also just read around it and find out sort of what um what it entails 
Then if you are obviously on a more macro level or in public sector kind of spaces, then you can look at the qualification that I mentioned before. UCT has a great postgraduate diploma, which I'm trying to get into, called the Postgrad Diploma in Development Finance. University of Stellenbosch also offers it. It basically teaches you finance for emerging economies, such as uh, most of the countries in Africa, and how that works, and how to attract FDI, and how to manage the funding of those impact projects that are not only environmentally centered, but a lot of them have a social component, social impact, you know, women empowerment, empowering the youth, because all of these are interconnected. So as much as I can sit and speak about green buildings, it's it's not an isolated sort of an approach, which is why you find that IFC, who pioneered the age certification, also do a lot of work with, uh, with the other aspects of sustainability, um, as outlined by, by the United Nations SDGs. So you will see that they're involved in, uh, in, in creating employment, uh, you know, having institutional sustainability in place, uh, justice for women and children and, and all those other aspects. Social sustainability is quite important because you cannot push the green agenda in isolation without addressing the other social impacts, social and, and economic impacts. So it's it's a very big ecosystem. It's grown very big in a very short space of time. And as you say, a lot of people are not aware just how far this has come until someone reveals it to them to say, actually, when you see this happening in South Africa, this is the background to, to what is happening there, you know. Um, I know the central government of South Africa is busy working on a on a local taxonomy now, you know, adapted after the EU taxonomy for for climate change and for for uh, for the in line with the Paris Agreement, etc. You know, so a lot is happening. It's just not so obvious, and unless you're willing to go out there and read up and find the information, but it's exciting, and there's so many opportunities and so little people on the market that uh, have the right. The qualifications are, are few and far between because, as I said, the education system still hasn't caught up, but there is a lot of add-ons that you can get to pair with your existing qualification and experience, and there's a lot of professional certifications that you can get. Um, but I know uh, in Europe and, and the U.S., there is a lot of, uh, green building set of qualifications that you can go for, not so much in South Africa. In South Africa, we, we tend to rely on these add-ons as, as I've described them. No, that's that's really great. Thank you. Those were some amazing tips. I think uh, whoever's listening to this podcast will really appreciate that kind of level of detail uh, mm. just to know this is what I can prepare myself for. Um, yeah. and, and maybe to add on to that, if you were to recommend one book to someone wanting to embody this space and take your advice and move forward, what would that book be? Sure. <laughs> it doesn't um, even have to be related to this field. Just maybe yeah. anything, mindset. or it's, it's two books, really. So I'm struggling yeah. to pin it down to one because I think both are equally important. And I think... If one can read both of those books, they can have a much, much better view of uh, where the world is, number one, and, and how they can go about achieving this. And maybe the other one speaks more to my personal philosophy. So the first one is um, Atomic Habits by James Clear. And it basically speaks about how we tend to expect um, a revolutionary change to come with a big event. You know, you kind of like, you expect to get rich by winning the lotto. Like this one event will define you, but most change doesn't happen that way. Most revolutions, most self-improvement, it's really centered on self-improvement, but there is a parallel there with the greening of, of the building uh, building sector and the, the fight towards saving the planet. It's those incremental changes over an extended period of time that in the end 
uh, result in most of the change that you see in the world. It's just doing 1% better this year and then another 1% better next year and so on and so forth. It may happen that there will be a big impact event and 50% of the world's problems are eradicated in one day, but it's not likely. So it, it's just about building healthy habits and how what the difference is between people who make plans and goals and actually achieve them and the rest of us who make plans and goals and sit two years later and think, well, where did I go wrong? <laughs> you know, And uh, the secret is, is simple. It's not the goals <laughs> that get the work done. It's the habits you form. Mm. And you should rather think of yourself not as a goal-oriented person, rather decide who, what your identity is and then act like someone, act like your future self. Start acting like your future self now and then you will become that person rather than holding up your future self as a goal to say, I want to become that person. Because the trap there is you never stop to think, so on a daily basis, what do I need to do to work towards that? So it's really identity-based change and embracing incremental, small incremental changes and rejecting the notion of big, massive events that will change your life. They may come, but not likely. Yes. Most change comes by just working one hour longer every yes, day. Yes. And you don't Spending have control time. over those big events. You've got control exactly. over the incremental changes you make. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So the second book is The 80-Minute NBA by Richard Dries. I've got it in front of me, front of me here because I always forget, I forget their names. The 80-Minute NBA by Richard Dries and John Nell. Um. It's based on an 80-minute sem seminar they, they used to do to try and teach people everything they'll learn from an MBA wow. within 80 minutes. So you can probably read this uh, in, I don't know, four hours if, you, if you're a fast reader. <laughs> it's, not a very, it's not a very thick book. It's, you know, it's manageable. But it basically, if you're not a finance person, if you're a non-finance person like me, it's a great book to figure out how business works, how the world of money works, and how you can apply that to your personal life. And the latest editions are great because they have a huge sustainability chapter in there. And why any business that is doing business without sustainability in mind, without thinking what is the impact of what I'm doing on the planet, is basically a dinosaur that is doomed to, to be extinct in a few years. So... Two great books, read those, and uh, you can have a conversation with virtually anyone about anything after that. Wow, thank you. Those sound amazing. I'm actually going to get those for myself now that you've explained them. Thank you. That's great. really cool. I love, that's my favorite part of the interview is hearing, you get to know the person really well when they recommend a book. You go, wow, okay, this person's interesting. Great. Yeah, so, yeah, <laughs> so the next thing I want to find out is, you know, looking at America and, and what they're doing over there in the U.S., they really seem to be focused on the lead system. And as you've said, South Africa, we've shifted our focus to the edge system. Um, how do we compare in these areas? You know, where is America really running strides ahead? And where is South Africa achieving really great success? Well, I, I have very limited knowledge in terms of, the greening endeavors in the US, but I can speak to the success of LEAD in South Africa and what I think South Africa is doing right. I think LEAD and South Africa failed to get traction in the residential space, like I said, but they do well in other building types, your hotels, corporate offices, etc. cetera. Um, I think the certification process for LEED, the cost of it and the length of the process tends to be prohibitive towards most South African developers because remember it's pegged in US dollars as well. Um, whereas EDGE is built in the local currency because there's always a local certifier like the Green Building Council of South Africa. So whatever country you're in, there's a local certifier that gives you a quote in local currency etc. So I think that works against it in South Africa and its complexity as well. 
and the fact that uh, Edge also has a free app. The, the Edge app is actually free. So you can go and improve your home, uh, create a profile on the Edge app and select measures, cut down electricity and water consumption on your home following those measures. You only incur a cost if you want a certificate to attach to your building to say my okay. home is certified as green. Yeah. Which would help you get move. your price if you wanted to sell. It's more like a exactly. incentive exactly. for selling. Perfect. That's exactly. great. But if you actually wanted to just do the work so you can have a more efficient home, that resource is there for you for free. Wonderful. And Edge recently launched as well an online version of a course that the IFC developed called the Design for Greater Efficiencies course. It's about six hours in total, self-paced. And for now, until probably April, you can complete it, take the exam, and get an AP certification, like I spoke of, for free. Wow. Because it is fully funded by the World Bank. You sure, know, at that's some point, amazing. It. So the way Edge offers all these free resources just for the sake of creating awareness, creating more green building professionals, I think, especially in South Africa, has created that level of, of, of support where in 2016, when you would say to someone, this is age certified, they didn't know that what, what that was. But now if you speak to especially architects and engineers and say, oh, no, we're going for age certification, they know exactly what you mean. You know, from two buildings certified in, in, in uh, 2015 to 92 projects and more than 35,000 homes, 38,000 homes, that's, that's a massive growth. And the same is happening in Ghana, Kenya, um, Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire, Egypt, Morocco, you know, and with more African countries to follow as well. And across the globe, we are in Southeast Asia, we are in South America, and so on and so forth. So I think the free resources and the, the easy access and the user friendliness of it. When I give edge training, I always say to the trainees, the best way to learn how to use the app is go use it on your own home. Go select those measures. And it's simple things like when you get to the water tab, it'll tell you, okay, in South Africa, our baseline tells us the average tap uh, has a flow rate of eight liters per minute. In order for you to achieve efficiency, reduce that flow rate to six or four liters per, per minute. And how do you do that? The small little flow restrictor you get from builders, you unscrew the tap, oh. you fit it with it. Wow. And it's done. Oh, wow. You go to your shower head, you do the same thing, you restrict the flow on all your taps, and you will see the difference on your water bill at the end of the month. Wow. And then it's your light fittings, you know. Uh, you enter what you've got and it'll tell you, okay, you need to change all of these to LEDs, this amount of wattage, and you will see the difference again. Sure. You know, even though the LEDs will be expensive for you to get now, but in, within two, three months, uh, not even, within a month, the amount you save in, in, in electricity will make up for, for the cost of those few light bulbs that you had to buy, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's things like that. So I think... From where I sit, I think lead isn't very visible to the average person, whereas edge is doing both. It's speaking to the professionals, to the municipalities, to central government, and it's speaking to the market in terms of trying to create a market for green buildings, trying yes. to emphasize and to explain to people why you want to live in a green building and what free resources are available to you to, to improve your home where you are without, without incurring a huge expense. So, so, yeah. That sounds wonderful. It's like they are they're building the demand as they build the supply. They're trying to kind of get that grassroots upwelling of people and their interest and their abilities. Very, very, that's a very innovative concept. Um, yeah. As opposed to being down, you know, the top down and this is the law and this is how you implement it. It's a really mm. great approach. Um, I'm, yeah. I'm actually going to check it out. I'm going to download the app for my house. because Yeah, uh, and that's the great thing. You don't need to download it. It's all web-based. So it's just oh. a website you go 
you nice. create your profile with your email and it saves your progress on there. And so you can even do it from your phone. It's very easy. Okay. Wow. Thank you. That is some amazing advice. Um, the, uh, the, the details you've given here, I feel like I've done a, a crash course in green building. <laughs> and I thought oh, I knew it, but, but I'm, I'm really, really, I've been updated immensely. So thank you for I'm, that. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I'm a green building evangelist. So I, I like you to are. leave people as you excited as I am. Are. <laughs> <laughs> and that's must, must be, ah, that guy is onto something, you know? Yes, so, no, yeah. absolutely. And, you know, your passion shines through when someone loves what they're doing. It's palpable. You can feel it and you can see it. It's not something you have to say, oh, this person's just working. This is, this is a calling for you. This is your purpose. So um, I want to thank you so much for your time. It has been so, so interesting listening to you. And I know all of our listeners will get immense value out of everything that you've shared. Um, and maybe if, if you have any other information about yourself or your projects that you'd like to share, or for me to send links at the bottom of the, um, obviously the video or the recording, um, you're welcome to add something else or any other takeaways that you just want to leave us with. Yeah, so um, you can have a look at the sort of uh, residential projects I work on by visiting similan.co.za, so S-I-M-I-L-A-N co.za and you can have a look at the edge app by visiting edge e d g e buildings.com and uh, there's a whole host of resources there and stories to read and it's 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 fascinating stuff wow thank you thank you i think this is really uh you could have we could have put a course together with all of this information <laughs> could be accrediting <laughs> these things you know <laughs> That's, that's just the tip of the iceberg. There is so much to, to learn and to do in this space. It's, it's, it really is exciting and an untapped opportunity if you're a young professional looking to make an impact in the world. And that's the other thing. I've always wanted work that is impactful where I can see that my work means something and it's making a difference to the planet, to other people's lives. You know. So if, if that's you, then you definitely want to work in this space. Yes, no, thank you, thank you. Wonderful. And it's so exciting to see, I feel in so many spaces where I'm speaking to people and working with people, there's this vacuum that's growing and the workload is getting bigger and bigger and the people are slowly filtering in and we need yeah. to actually figure out, and that's part of the reason I do the work that I do is to try and, you know, jumpstart these people to enter into these spaces and start making these contributions and finding work that is meaningful to them. So thank you. You've helped me to help them today. Um, it's a pleasure. Thank you for listening to this episode funded by the U.S. Embassy and in partnership with the Youth Bridge Trust. For more information on the Green Economy Academy and South African and American Youth Dialogue on the Green Economy, visit the Youth Bridge Trust on www.youthbridgetrust.org. We would like to thank our sponsors, the U.S. Embassy, for making these episodes possible. Remember to tune in for our next episode.